Mesdames et messieurs, bonsoir. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to this uh, first event of the 2020 Bright Colloquium. As you can imagine, this is a quite peculiar year, and as everything is going to happen online, we're in an empty room in Geneva, which holds 600 people usually, but um, there's uh, very few people in the room. I hope lots of you are following us online. I'm Olivier Desibourg, and I'm a scientific journalist. And I will have the pleasure and honor to accompany you every evening of this week to lead these presentations and events. So we're very happy to welcome worldwide renowned mathematicians, and they're going to take us on this extraordinary journey of mathematics, not the mathematics that uh, gave you so much so many problems when you were at school, Blaise Pascal already said that in his day that life is all about mathematics. So I don't know if the speakers this evening believe the same thing, but I'm sure they will tell you a fantastic story about mathematics and explain that mathematics is a way of preparing oneself for philosophy, poor poetry, as Jean Dormesson used to say, or even an art form. As you know, there are two parts of this evening. There's the presentation, first and foremost, and then a Q&A session, again, a peculiar year because everything is going to happen online. I will explain the details in a few minutes as to the way in which we're going to proceed. Before we get down to brass tacks, I would like to give the floor to two speakers Yves Flukiger, the rector of the University of Geneva. You have the floor, sir. President, students, colleagues, it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome you here this evening, not face to face, but online in a remote version for the 19th Wright Colloquium. We've started the 2020 colloquium it was in fact we are tremendously impacted by the second COVID-19 wave that's why this is happening online and that is why we are making it possible for as many participants as possible to follow the presentations so we no longer meet face to face but I'm sure that we have increased our impact the relationship between the Geneva University and the Wright Foundation is a long one it's since 1984 that we've organized Wright Colloquia within our university scientists worldwide reputation come together in Geneva every two years to present their field of expertise to the public at large and our colloquia have become increasingly well known and we've been able to call on many uh, Nobel Prize laureates and this year many uh, recipients of the Fields Medal. So the university is very much involved because it makes available its rooms and logistics and means of communication, but also call on its uh, professors to host the events specialized in the area that is the particular topic for this year. And this year, we are going to talk about mathematics. So obviously, the purpose of the Wright Foundation is to disseminate uh, scientific progress to the public at large. And this is part and parcel of the university task. We therefore support various projects of uh, extension work. And thanks to our professors, we are very happy indeed to listen to five speakers this year who are recipients of Fields Medal for five evenings from the 2nd to the 6th. We'll listen to them talk about mathematics amongst the uh, Fields Medal recipients. Some of them have studied here in Geneva, amongst them Martin um, 
Clara, we should have been able to listen to Vaughan Jones, who should have made a presentation on Friday. But we'll listen to Professor uh, Smirnov because unfortunately Vaughan Jones left us in September. So we are going to create a link between art and mathematics, and we were going to organize a light show. Unfortunately, it's not going to happen this year. But as I said, you will be able to listen to the presentations online, and you will be able to do this once you've um, connected yourself to the uh, right website. As I said, the light show is not going to happen this year. It should have started already last week on Wednesday, but we had to cancel the event uh, given the decisions made by the federal government, and it will be postponed until next year. So I'd like to thank all those who've done their utmost to organize this remote right colloquium. I must say they have worked unceasingly so as to make this possible. Thank you for being with us this evening for this remote colloquium. I wish you a very pleasant week. Thank you, Rector. As I said, this uh, light show has been cancelled this year, but it's been postponed, as was said, until 2021. I now would like to give the floor to Thierry Courvoisier, the president of the Wright Foundation, who's in charge of this colloquium. It's a foundation which is a very important one in Switzerland because it's created a dialogue between uh, society and science. Rector, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure, even though it is a very peculiar year, to open the 2020 Wright Colloquium. Many of you are listening to us online. I'm sorry I can't see you, but obviously I'm very happy that you'll be able to listen to what is being said this throughout the world, and I'm very happy indeed that the Wright Foundation has given us the possibility of focusing our thoughts for a while on mathematics, a superb construct of the human brain. So, mathematics are as much an exercise of our imagination, a formal description of our thought process, and a key tool to understand the world that surrounds us. Without mathematics, we cannot understand the laws of nature. The conferences of the Wright Colloquium in the recent years focused on the spectacular progress of our understanding of the physical, chemical, and biological world. And therefore, time had come, I think, to focus on the tool which allows us to make this tremendous progress. So we wanted to do this not only to understand the tool and its relationship with the physical world, but also for the tool itself and its relationship with our rational thought process. And I'm very thankful to our speakers, the top-notch mathematicians, five of them, They've accepted to rise to the challenge to share with us their knowledge and their thoughts. So as you can understand or imagine, the organization of the 2020 colloquium was particularly complicated. It's also been, uh, we've also been saddened by the demise of Vaughan Jones, who should, have, uh, who should have taken the floor on Friday. He'd accepted our invitation to do so. He was a uh, world wide known mathematician. He'd been awarded the Fields Medal in 1990. He, Geneva's very close to his heart because this is where he was awarded his doctorate in 1979. He was a close friend of many of our colleagues who were looking very much forward to meeting up with him this week. And Anton Alexeyev is going to talk of Vaughan Jones and his work more at length on Friday. We should have been able to end our colloquium on a light show on the building of the university in the Parc des Bassions. This has been postponed to next year, and it will amply demonstrate that we can uh, approach mathematics with human poetry. Allow me to underscore that several speakers of this week have very close relationships with the uh, mathematicians in Geneva. This is not down to chance or any local preference. This is something that obviously we avoid as a foundation, but simply because the Mathematics Institute of our university is one of the very best in the world, and it's therefore quite normal when you're looking for the best in the world 
to find people who have links with our university one way or another. I'd also like to thank, in particular this year, all those who've made the whole colloquium possible, whether we're talking about logistics and technology and interpreters in French and English and the uh, scientific organization down to Anton Alexeyev and obviously all the people have been working very, very hard so as to make it possible for you to listen in to what we're going to hear throughout the week, seated on your couch in the utmost comfort and downing a beer or a glass of wine. So. Thank you for that, Professor Kouazi. I'd like to now go down to the to you about the details this evening. You'll be able to put questions for those who are on the colloquium website. You should have a square on the video which will allow you to put questions. If you're listening in on Facebook, uh, live, you can put your questions on the website and you can put your questions in French and English and we will then put them forward. Let's go to the conference proper and to introduce the speaker for this evening, I would now like to give the floor to the only mathematics uh, professor who is a lady, Tatiana Svetvana. She is going to make a presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm very happy indeed to present to you the speaker of this evening, Etienne Guis, French mathematician. Professor Gis is a mathematician in charge of uh, research at the CNRS in Lyon. He is going to speak to us this evening from Paris. Unfortunately, the sound is interrupted. He spent many years in Lyon and developed close links with the Mathematics Institute in Geneva. And this is a picture of him at the Geneva University in 20, 2004. He oversaw 20 dissertations, and his former students teach mathematics in France and elsewhere. For many years now, he's been investing his time in disseminating mathematics, and he has, in fact, co-authored two films, Dimensions and Chaos, and he's also in charge of a fantastic French-speaking site, Image Mat. He's interested in all sorts of theories, mathematical theories, and he's been awarded many prestigious prizes in France and elsewhere. His research focuses mainly on geometry and dynamic systems. As based also on the contributions in Henri Poincaré, tries to see how the world evolves at various levels in a regular fashion and on a more chaotic fashion. And that is the topic for his presentation this evening, chaos, unpredictable, 
but understandable. You have the floor, Etienne. Tatiana. Thank you, Tatiana. I'm delighted to be with you this evening. Although we're living in troubled times, so perhaps I'll try and start off by listing positive points. Firstly, we found out recently that with so many people listening in that the servers were down. So let's be bold and think that millions are listening in. That's a fantastic piece of good news. Secondly, usually when you listen to a mathematician, he's in front of a blackboard, and as you can see behind me, there's this fantastic tapestry of colors. It's a fantastic work of art because it's an obusson tapestry with lots and lots of butterflies, which are the very core of my presentation this evening. And the other very positive point that I'd like to mention, which I find particularly enjoyable, is the people who are listening in are uh, listening comfortably seated in their couch or settee and drinking a glass of wine and beer. So I'm very happy for them. So I was told uh, as, uh, auditorium usually uh, filled with 600 people, but I think I can see a few people here and there. And I think he's one of the worldwide specialists of my field, Jean-Pierre Ekman. Yes, I did recognize you from the back. So I don't know why he's listening in. He's not going to learn a great deal this evening, so I'm going to share what's on my computer screen so that we can launch the discussion. So I'm going to talk to you about chaos and butterflies. And what I'd like to stress this evening is the key theme of this presentation. Mathematicians tend to go on and on and on, and nobody really listens. Perhaps people just switch off because it's too complicated to listen to, and perhaps it's their fault because they speak in a very complicated way. So this idea of the butterfly has gone down very well in the population at large. The butterfly effect and chaos is one of the very rare examples of a mathematical concept which everybody th thinks they understand. And I'm now going to explain to you that that, in fact, is a fallacy because nobody really understands it. So the flapping of the butterfly uh, wings, can this generate a uh, tornado in Texas? That's the key question. Everybody's understood, in any case, uh, that the sensitivity to initial conditions, a tiny chain can lead to huge changes in the future. So a slight change, a tiny change in the initial conditions can lead to major changes in the future. As I said, a tiny little butterfly could lead to a tornado breaking out. It's not that it's wrong, but that's not the content of the chaos theory, which I'm going to try and explain to you this evening. So this slight change that could lead to tremendous, humongous changes in the future. That's not really the topic of the conversation. That's a simplistic view. Here you have the portrait of Edward Lawrence. He was a meteorologist. So can't say whether he was really a physicist or a mathematician. He started a thesis a doctorate in uh, mathematics, and then he went off to a war, the First World War. He was far more interested in weather conditions. And then after the war, when he came back, he was, became more interested in meteorology. And he came up with a tremendous discovery, which we're going to discuss this evening. And this discovery 
was something was understood by the public at large because of this business with the butterfly wings and the tornado, and we'll come back to that later. So what's interesting here is that what Lawrence actually said, a butterfly in Brazil may set off a tornado in Texas. If you uh, look for butterfly effect on Google, it's very strange because you can find all sorts of things, uh, incredible things. So you think that with coronavirus, it's the tiny little virus that generates these huge consequences. But I find it very funny, but if you type in uh, does the flap of the butterfly wings in Brazil set off a tornado in Texas? So I've come up with a little list of what I found on the internet on Google. So it can, in fact, uh, relate to the rainforest in the Amazon, Sumatra, uh, the garden in Manila, the Philippines, Tokyo, Brazil, etc., etc. But I nevertheless find a constant here. If you check on Google, because it's a cultural uh, element, Google, I mean, how this element, in fact, percolated down into the public. Very often it's a small cause that comes from an underdeveloped country that affects and uh, negatively developed countries. So there's, uh, there's always this uh, meaning there. So it's something which has been well received by the public. And then I'll give you a few other examples. And we'll try and make you understand why Lawrence's message is far more interesting than this uh, slight change that can have huge consequences. So I'm going to show you two examples where you see the butterfly effect. This is an ad where a tiny thing can lead to huge consequences. Life comes at you fast. Be ready with nationwide investments, retirement, insurance. Nationwide is on your side. So as you can see, that's an interesting example where a tiny event led to these enormous consequences. And the second example, which is quite fun as well, shows a mathematician who's nice mathematician in Jurassic Park, where you have a rather interesting scene. It's the butterfly effect, which can uh, set off a tornado somewhere else. That's fantastic. For instance, I'll give you an example. We'll do an experiment. So. If you let this droplet fall on your hand, which way is it going to fall? This way or that way? OK. So just stay still. And I'm going to try and place the droplet in the same place, but the same way. Oh, look, it's changed. Why has it changed? Because there's a tiny variation of the way in which you've been holding your hand and also the warmth of your hands, which has caused your veins to dilate and stand out. And that's why it has changed the path of the droplet. Yes, you can see nobody could have uh, understood it better than, excuse me. So another example. And again, I'm on my own. And that's the theory of chaos. So he's tried to explain that 
theory of chaos, i.e. he's not being able to seduce this young woman. Okay, let's be a bit more serious now and let's look at another example. There are lots and lots of films that mention the butterfly effect. Again, the same uh, reductive interpretation, uh, slight change, huge impact. So what was Lawrence about in 1962? He's trying to understand how the atmosphere works. They have a very simplified drawing where you have a slice of the atmosphere. You see the air with different temperatures based on the difference in altitude. And then you have a bit of turbulence. And this leads to these flows of uh, warm air coming up and you try and understand the atmospheric uh, dynamics. And it's very, very complicated. And Lawrence has tried to better understand the phenomenon and decided to oversimplify the movement as much as possible. So he is it's a sort of caricature. So he's taken the elements, has simplified the elements. He's a mathematician. He knows that he's not really solving physical problems, but he simplifies the equation down to the bare bones. And you have three differential equations that he comes up with, and he enters this in his computer. The computer is a very primitive computer in 1962. He sees something happen, and he sees the evolution of the parameters that he's studying that is very strange indeed, very chaotic. And in particular, he notices that if he changes the initial condition, the future is totally different. So he'd given up on these calculations. And then a few minutes later on, he had a cup of tea. And he started up his uh, calculations again practically in the same conditions and came to realize that the differences were huge. And that's what was called the butterfly effect. The slight change in the initial conditions, for instance, in the atmosphere may lead to uh, huge changes in the future. So I'll show you a few drawings or uh, graphs that you find in Lawrence's uh, articles. I thoroughly recommend to all mathematics and physics students to read this article. I don't know whether it's a mathematics article or a physics animal. It's a remarkable article which explains that Lawrence has understood the phenomenon and he's understood far more than this very simple idea that a slight change in the initial conditions can lead to huge change. What happened was that Lawrence's was invited to attend this colloquium, and it was said that he was dragging his feet. He didn't want to send in the title of his presentation. All those who organize uh, colloquia know that you have to do this well ahead in advance. And so the colloquium organizer decided on a title for Lawrence's presentation. And uh, he came up with the flapping of the butterfly wings. Uh, can this generate a tornado? S sorry, in uh, Brazil, can generate a tornado in Texas. So it's the colloquium organizer that, who came up with the title. And this met with huge success. I mean, even today, this is an example that everybody understands. So why? Uh, is this happened in the world of physics and not in the world of mathematics? Why mathematics? I mean, I mean, a lot of work had been done on this, but ideas were not well received. First of all, mathematicians were way ahead, so far ahead that nobody understood. And I show you for a few examples that. Hadamard and Poincaré had highlighted in the same way the same phenomenon of sensitivity to initial conditions that explained it thoroughly. 
But uh, nobody listened to these uh, mathematicians at all. And we had to wait until the 60s when Lawrence arrived on the scene and uh, explained this phenomenon in a very surprising fashion. And uh, suddenly the mathematicians at the same time who were caught on a back foot who found it very difficult to understand that Lawrence had resuscitated a phenomenon and explained thoroughly by Ademar and Poincaré, but mathematicians caught up very quickly and are now explain what they decided to do after that. Now we have to go back to very ancient ideas in the development of science and to the idea of determinism. Let's have a look at this paper by Hadamar dating uh, back to 1897. Reading it again, I can tell you that it's very difficult to see a link with this butterfly effect. Nevertheless, in 1897, Hadamar wrote a very interesting paper where he imagined a ball running on a surface, but the surface has the shape that you can see here. And Adama tried to understand what would be the movement of this ball on such a surface. It's very abstract, <clears throat> and for a mathematician it's a wonderful paper, but uh, for everybody uh, it's not really clear. Duhem, in 1906, wrote a wonderful book called uh, Physical Theory, Its Object and Its Structure, where a whole chapter is devoted to uh, making Hadamard's uh, discovery uh, better known. It's even poetic, I must say. I'm just going to show you a few examples. He says, for example, let's imagine the uh, head of a bull with the parts uh, where the horns are linked. Uh, let's try to make them as long as possible, limitless, so that they extend to the infinite. And this will be one of the surfaces that we study. Well, uh, let me tell you that Adama didn't write it with the same style. And then he says, if a material point is thrown on the surface that we study, from a position and with a specific velocity, the mathematical deduction can determine the trajectory of this point. But with the vis physician, this deduction is simply useless. I'm not going to show you exactly what's happening on the head of a bull, but I'm going to show you a short video, which I find extremely interesting, because it shows that we can play billiards with a ray of light in an area where you have pillars where this uh, ray of light is bouncing off. Uh, hardly anybody could possibly foresee where the ray of light is going to end its track. It's both very simple, understandable, and very complicated. You understand the reflection of the ray of light with a very deterministic curve. You can have an equation for that, and you know exactly what's happening. But after 10, 15, 20 bouncing offs, you can't possibly deduct where exactly or foresee where exactly this ray of light is going to end. Mathematical deduction can determine the trajectory of this point, but for the physician, this deduction is simply useless. If I change only very slightly the initial direction of this ray of light, you would obviously have a very different ending point. And this observation, this sensitivity to initial conditions had been made by Hadamard, and Duhem had wonderfully explained it, even in a very poetic style. But unfortunately, the public at large didn't buy into it. I think this can be explained. It's a failure in communication, so to speak. 
because I think 1906 was not the right time. In 1906, science hadn't even in discovered quantum mechanics. There was no relativity theory or mathematicians and all scientists were arrogantly optimistic. They thought that they'd be able one day to understand everything in the world. And people like Adamard or Duhem tried to explain that it was more complicated than that, but nobody wanted to listen, actually. So at least 1960, you had to wait until 1960 and Lawrence to take up again this message and make it real. And mathematics and physics started to become part and parcel of our everyday culture. Poincaré, too, had understood it. In 1908, he wrote, he says more or less the same thing as Lawrence. It's quite astonishing. Why have meteorologists such difficulty in predicting the weather with any certainty? Why? We see that great disturbances are generally produced in regions where the atmosphere is un in an unstable equilibrium. Meteorologists see very clearly that this equilibrium is unstable, that a cyclone will be formed somewhere, but they can't tell you exactly where a tenth of a degree, more or less, at any given point will lead to the fact that the cyclone will burst here and not there and extend its ravages over districts it would otherwise have spared. If they had been aware of this tenth of a degree, they could have known it beforehand, but the observations were neither sufficiently comprehensive nor sufficiently precise, and this is the reason why it all seems due to the intervention of chance. So there again you have the idea of minimal initial changes having huge consequences in the end, even leading to disaster. Now, in 1908, this is a remarkable thing to say. And it has hardly anything to do with the nice little butterfly and the tornado in Texas. But this hasn't been taken up by anybody, even coming from someone so famous as Poincaré. And why was that? Because at the time, people wanted to be able or to think that they were able to understand the whole world without any risk of mistake. The model that had been at the forefront over the whole of the 19th century, the deterministic model with the river flowing, and uh, if you know exactly the speed of the current, from a point zero, you can determine exactly where the current will be uh, at uh, point x, uh, one, two, or three. This is typically deterministic. We all have our destiny. We know the starting point, and we know where we'll end. This is typically 19th century determinism. The role of mathematicians at least until the beginning of the 20th century, was precisely to determine x1 starting from x0. I know where I am now, and I will know exactly when I am in one second time. This seems very easy, but it's too easy. It's even naive. You can take the definition by Laplace of determinism. This is a wonderful sentence. We ought then to consider the present state of the universe as the effect of its previous state and as the cause of that which is to follow. An intelligence that at a given point in time could comprehend all the forces by which nature is animated and the respective situation of the beings that make it up. If, moreover, this intelligence were vast enough to submit these data to analysis, would encompass in the same formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the lightest atoms. For such an intelligence, nothing would be uncertain, and the future, like the past, would be open to its eyes. This is really the declaration of the dogma of determinism. But Laplace was fully aware 
of the fact that everything was determined by differential equations. But he also knew that the problem was too complex for anybody to master it. You would need a superhuman intelligence. Determining the future starting from the past is indeed for him possible at a theoretical level, but impossible from the point of view of the physicist. This is a very famous sentence, which uh, I think sums it up perfectly. Now, if you take the current of a river, you can have events like this one, two particles or two elements floating on the water, and suddenly you see a rock in the middle of the river. And these two elements go different paths and have a very different future with the same starting point. So there's no need quoting Adama, Duhem, etc. to lead to that kind of conclusions. I think everybody understands it. Everybody lives and experiences this in their personal lives. We all know that uh, missing your train can have uh, huge consequences on your life. You can't, for example, arrive uh, sick at a uh, very important exam and uh, have a different career from then on. It is very sad that popular culture was so concentrated and focused on this idea of the butterfly effect in that sense. Let's take the example of the solar system. These calculations have been made by Jacques Lascar. Uh, these were numeric calculations in order to know exactly what happened with planets. Let's imagine a sun and a couple of uh, planets around the sun. And his question was, how come that small um, changes in the initial conditions can have repercussions at a larger scale? So every 10 millions of years, the differences are multiplied by 10. For example, if you imagine the moon, you change the position of the moon by one meter. 10 millions of years later, the moon that you've moved by one meter will be 10 meters away from the position it had been or should have been 10 million years before. Well, 10 meters is not much, you'd say, but wait longer, wait 100 millions of years. And then, I hope I'm not mistaken in my calculation, after 100 millions of years, this difference in one meter will have become 10 million kilometers. And then you'll see that the nature of the orbit will have changed dramatically. It is simply impossible to know where the Earth was 10 million years ago and where it will be in 10 million years time, 10, 10 million years time. So calculations by Lascar gave us a um, an order of magnitude that was quite interesting, millions of years. Now, let's talk about mathematicians. I skipped that very rapidly. And maybe I will not explain everything in details, but what happened was about 10 years after Lawrence, mathematicians came back and used examples that became paradigms. They've studied these examples, but without having realized how important Lawrence's work was. Smail, who is told to have made a discovery on Copacabana's beach, uh, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but in any case, it's interesting to note that Smail, great mathemati mathematician, who had already received a Fields Medal, didn't even know about Lawrence. And worse, even, 
he told me personally, he had read nothing, not a word by Poincaré. So the same problem was studied again from afresh with a different uh, way of looking at it without taking into consideration what had been done before. Now, Smale created a kind of dynamic in the upper part. On the right, you see a kind of compressed state, then an extension of that state. And then if you go back to the left, you fold it, and this looks like a horse show. And Smale tried to study what happened when the initial oval transports itself into this uh, horseshoe. And when you iterate the same situation a great many number of times. I'm not going to show you important theorems, but at least this declaration seems very remarkable. And neither Lawrence nor Poincaré nor Adamard had ever dreamed of something like that. Smale understood that a complicated system, which we call chaotic nowadays, can be illustrated by the example of a horseshoe. A horseshoe is both chaotic and structurally stable. Let me explain. This is absolutely extraordinary. It's both complex and stable. Well, you don't, you tend not to believe it because if it's complex, it shouldn't be stable. But this is an illustration that may help you ex understand it. You see the oval transformed into a horseshoe. And then I change slightly the oval, which is not quite oval, that changes into something that is not quite a horseshoe either. So it's a different function, a different transformation. And this new transformation remains chaotic, which is not surprising. But basically, it's the same one. It's stable. F, the first function and the second function remain the same, even if you change the coordinates. The structure is stable. But if you haven't understood, don't worry. I'm going to try and explain that by quoting again Poincaré. I like this sentence that was written in 1908, and which I think is very far-sighted. You are asking me, asking me to predict future phenomena. If, by stroke of uh, bad luck, I happen to know the laws of these phenomena, I could achieve this goal only at the price of inextricable computations, and I wouldn't be able to answer you. But since I am lucky enough to ignore these laws, I will answer you straight away. And the most astonishing thing is that my answer will be correct. So now you enter the positive part of, the, of chaos theory and uh, butterfly effect. And I find it quite remarkable. I try to explain that to you now. And I hope that will be the message that you'll, you'll uh, go back home with. Or if you're already home, sorry, you'll keep in mind. These are two sentences written by Lawrence in one of his papers, in initial papers, which I find really important. And if you follow and understand these two sentences, I'm sure that you'll have understood everything I wanted to tell you. The first one is the following one. If a single flap of a butterfly's wing can be instrumentally in generating a tornado, all the other previous and subsequent flaps of its wings, uh, as can the fl flaps of the wings of the millions of other butterflies, not to mention the activities of innumerable more powerful creatures, including our own species. If you say that uh, the flapping of the wings of uh, the butterfly in Brazil creates a tornado in Texas, it's obviously very naive. The uh, tornado in Texas is the result of uh, millions of butterflies uh, flapping their wings, and not only in Brazil, but everywhere. It's a 
this butterfly in Brazil is part of the series of events that lead to the tornado. Chain of causality is not as naive as that. But now let me turn to the second sentence, which I find even more important. I am proposing that over the years, minute disturbances neither increase nor decrease the frequency of occurrence of various weather events such as hot tornadoes. The most they may do is to modify the sequence in which these events occur. Let me try and explain. And I think this is the right way of looking at chaos theory. It still remains a conjecture, a hypothesis, something that hasn't been demonstrated yet. Even in 2020, these questions are, remain unanswered. So what does it mean exactly? Lawrence says that um, the butterflies' uh, wings m or flapping of wings might generate a tornado in uh, Texas, but it's not going to change the frequency of occurrence of tornadoes in Texas. This is interesting. We don't care about the fact that a tornado might happen on the 27th of July. What we're interested in, in knowing how many tornadoes will go over to Texas in a given year. So if you ask a question that is more statistic in nature, if you think about the frequency of events, then there is something to understand there. That is the lesson to be drawn from Lorenz. A small event can have catastrophic uh, consequences. That is so obvious that you don't need to be a Poincaré to understand it. But the second lesson, or what the second sentence means, is that the scientist is there to try and understand the frequency of occurrence of certain events. And let me try and show you two examples. This is a very well-known example. You have a wheel that's going round and you've got recipients and there's a hole at the bottom of the recipient and we open the tap so the water falls into the uh, hoppers and the water increases and then comes out and you see that this movement is entirely deterministic so with LACE, we've been able to come up with a program to show the movements of the wheel. But if you look at the movement, you see that it's absolutely incredible. One time it's on the left, one time it's on the right, and it's difficult to understand. If I ask you where the wheel is going to be in 15 seconds, you cannot tell me where it's going to be. And the reason why you cannot tell me where it's going to be is because of the sensitivity to initial conditions. So these are two mills, two wheels, uh, very close, but you see that the position of the two mills uh, vary by a hundredth of a degree. So the two mills are going round, more or less, in a similar fashion, and then comes a point in time, let's wait a bit, look, they're practically running the same course, and then suddenly, look at what happens. One goes to the left, and the other one goes to the right, and then that's it. Everything is completely different afterwards. So you see the dependence on the sensitivity to initial conditions. Now, now we're going to do what statisticians do. This is something you can do at home with plastic beakers. It works very well. Joss did this in his garden, and it works very well. The wheel goes round in a chaotic fashion. It's very difficult to predict where it's going to be at in 15 seconds. So, so you take the wheels, the previous one, the one I showed you, and make it go round. And every second, let's say, you look at the position of the wheel. You look at the angle which is going round, and you do this for a few hours. And then you see the positions of the wheel at every second that passes, and you look at this over several hours. And what a statistician is going to do, where well, they're going to come up with a, a bar graph 
and a histogram, and they're going to show the spread of the measurements of the wheel that we observed. So very often the wheel is in the middle and sometimes to the left and sometimes to the right, and you see the shape, the spread, the distribution of the wheel angle as a function of time. So it doesn't tell you where the wheel was at a given point in time, but it tells you where on average what we notice after two hours the wheel is mainly in the middle but you have two peaks on the left hand and the right hand side and that's where it becomes important if you do the same thing with the two wheels the left one and the right one the two wheels are different their lives are totally different after a given uh, a certain amount of time they are totally uh, turning on their own in their own way and when you do the statisticians model we get the same diagram and we have totally different wheels that are turning in a totally disconnected way but if you look at the statistics of their position over a relatively long period of time, well, you get more or less the same result. So statistics do not seem to be based on the initial conditions. And that's what Lawrence's message is all about. And it's a very constructive message. I'd just like to remind you the butterfly wings may generate a tornado, but it's not going to change the frequency at which tornadoes are generated, and that's the, what's important. That's the scientific message with all sorts of additional questions, and I'll try and say a few words about that because the truth of the matter today is in 2020, well, Lawrence's intuition was to show this in many, many cases, but it still remains a question which has yet no answer. Now, this is slightly more complex. So you have the Lawrence uh, butterfly, the trajectory, the pink ball, and you look at it over a period of time. So capital T, a very long period of time. And the Lawrence intuition is that the proportion of time, the statistic of time, is independent of the initial condition. The limit does not seem to depend on the initial conditions. That's Lawrence's message. And if that's true, if we can demonstrate that, it would be absolutely extraordinary because it would give us information that runs counter to what was said earlier on about unpredictability. We saw this in the Jurassic Park extract. So this is something that is predictable. We can predict the statistics. We can even calculate the statistics. That's Lawrence's message, which I find highly interesting. And I think it deserves to be more widely known. So this is a theorem. Uh, so to show you that mathematicians do a bit of work. This is a relatively complicated uh, theorem because it's the work of lots and lots of people and it's called the SRB, the sinai rel bowen uh, measure. And it goes to prove that Lawrence is right that the limit has nothing to do with the initial conditions. So we've been able to demonstrate, as Lawrence has seen, that with this SRB measure, it's again the result of uh, teamwork. We've got lots and lots of uh, similar examples. Lawrence's intuition, gut feeling, has been demonstrated. So these are just uh, general examples. And I just wanted to point out that what I describe uh, is not very precise, but it would seem that Lawrence's 
nearly always right that the, for everything there should be SRB uh, measures that describe the trajectories, all the trajectories. So, so what would I mean quasi or nearly always right? I cannot explain because I don't have enough time to do so. But that's what's at stake here. We have to show that Lawrence is right, but not always, but nearly always. And that question, uh, fortunately, or for mathematicians, because it's a, a question which obviously gives a lot of food for thought to mathematicians. So stochastically, uh, this remains stable, i.e. that the uh, disturbance doesn't really affect the SRB axiom. So here you have histograms like I showed you the wheel, but these are histograms that were uh, done by Lascar. Instead of using a wheel, he used the virtual solar system on his computer, and I had two wheels going round, and I looked at the statistics I can't remember, was it 30,000 seconds? But Lascar had his computer run over hundreds of millions of years, not his computer, but the virtual social solar system uh, ran for several millions of, hundreds of millions of years. He looked at the curves and realized that this was correct. The eccentricities, the major axes, he realized that uh, Lawrence was entirely right. And to my knowledge, this has yet to be demonstrated. It's an experimental observation, but it seems to be quite clear from a mathematical point of view, but it's not yet a theorem. Now, I'm going to conclude, so this is probably a question that's going to come up. Yes, fine, you're a mathematician, but what does this mean in real life? I mean, does Lawrence's example, does it have anything to do with the atmosphere? I mean, Lawrence had so simplified the equation that it doesn't mean anything, so there was a debate in 1966. Arnold wrote a fantastic article saying more or less that the atmosphere is uh, very chaotic, and then you have the butterfly effect no longer exists by Robert in 2001, but it's explaining that it's not that simple, that uh, jury is still out, and we don't know whether the chaos exists in the atmosphere or not. And when you look at the photos, it certainly looks like chaos, but I'm sure perhaps be able to discuss this further during the Q&A session, whether this phenomenon in mathematical terms can be observed or not. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. These are questions for mathematicians. Is chaos a frequent occurrence? When I talk about a limit, when time is infinite. What do we mean by infinite? Uh, are we talking about 100 million years? And then there's the conservative case, uh, which applies to celestial mechanics. And that's entirely a whole new ball game. I'd like to end on a quotation that I find fantastic, which is by Buffon. And it's a a very uh, interesting quotation because we understands that Buffon had understood everything that needed to be understood about the complexity of uh, the universe. It's, it's a very uh, it's a very long, simple sentence. In fact, it's the end of a sentence that goes on for two pages. So everything possible, and it's uh, well written, everything possible will occur because every Eventually, everything will meet everything else in the infinite cosmos as it continuously evolves and all matter intermingles. Every possible shape is formed. Every possible pattern is printed. Therefore, all objects either come closer or move away from one another, collide or escape, combine or separate. 
Everything is produced or destroyed by supporting and opposing forces that are constant and power the universe, transforming it into a theater with scenes that are always new and actors that are continuously reborn. And I think this is a lovely illustration of what our universe is all about, about the uh, butterfly effect. And I think that this is an illustration illustration of what mathematicians call uh, gotics. Thank you. And thank you very much, Etienne Gis, for this fantastic um, trip down the uh, road of butterfly wings. And we have with us Antonin Alexeyev, who uh, teaches mathematics at the Geneva University. Then we have Natania Smirnova who's also going to take part in the discussion, and uh, Shala Fiorelli, who's going to pass on all the questions that I now ask you to put on the Right Colloquium website. So just uh, enter your question, and uh, Shala is going to put these questions to the three participants and the panel members. So. Allow me to start the ball rolling and uh, put questions to you, Mr. Gis, because you are the uh, core of this evening. You talked about the chaos theory, which is often s perceived negatively by the public because uh, source of uh, a number of disorders. But you said that it's also a very constructive uh, theory. So how can that be? Well, what I try to explain is that the is this unpredictable aspect, given the sensitivity to the initial conditions and then the positive effect of the possibility we have to assess and evaluate statistics and frequencies. And that's what I mean by constructive. Let's take a very simple example in meteorology. We know that it, beyond 15 days or 30 days, it's impossible to predict the temperature at a given uh, place. So we don't know. However, if we ask ourselves what would the mean temperature over the last 10 years in August in Geneva. Well, I can't calculate that, but it can be done. It is possible to calculate the mean temperature in August in Geneva over 10 years, but we don't know what the temperature will be on the 10th of August in 10 years' time in Geneva. So I think we need to dwell on the positive aspect of this theory. We can do all sorts of uh, scientific and statistical predictions. So unpredictable, but nevertheless understandable. So what, we can come up with an equation? No, that's not what I said. The, it's easy to develop of an equation. Unfortunately, the sound is very poor, is coming and going. So the precise question is to know whether it's going to rain at a given point in time. And this precise prediction is very complicated, but a statistical uh, prediction over a long period of time is possible and feasible. But earlier on, you said it was fantastic that mathematics were so imprecise. 
Is that still the case? No, no, no. Again, misunderstanding. I'm not talking about the lack of precision. Unfortunately, the interpreter cannot interpret sound that is coming and going. I'm talking about imprecision in the mathematical act of creation in the research. We can be imprecise in our thought process. But when the theorem is put on the table, then it has to be precise. You haven't talked about the football of the World Cup in 2014. And a theorem can apply, and you were absolutely flabbergasted that the Adidas engineers weren't aware of a theorem of uh, Alexander Popovov. Uh, I'm sure we're not familiar with, and this is a question for all of you. To what extent is it important to be familiar with the work of one's predecessors in mathematics to uh, go forward? I mean, you mentioned Smale and others, but how much do we know, need to know about what the previous work of our predecessors is to be able to forge ahead? Well, it's a bit like the cantons in Geneva, in, in Switzerland, sorry. Um, there are lots and lots of different mathematicians. There's, for instance, Smale, who's not interested in the history of mathematics, is not interested in the theoretical development of his ideas, but others are perhaps more contemplative than creative, and they can disseminate the information. I uh, like to dwell on history books and try and find out how things come about. And I like to share with others. As you know, mathematical creation is team effort. And it's true that some mathematicians don't concern themselves with what was done by their predecessors, but it's important that other mathematicians look at the work that was done by previous uh, mathematicians. What's important is that we all come together and come up with a delectable dish. What do you think, Mrs. Smirnova? Yes, I entirely agree with Etienne. Diversity is what uh, uh, allows us to make progress in uh, mathematics, but it's nevertheless naive to think that there's uh, going to have a mathematician who's going to come up with a beautiful theory without thinking about what was done by his predecessors. Perhaps in the past this was the case, but uh, everything is speeding up, and the same applies to mathematics and their development. What I think is remarkable and was shown quite clearly in uh, Etienne's uh, presentation is that with the recent developments, we can come up with new questions and come up with new ideas based on what was tested many, many years ago. So if you review what the, your forebears wrote, you can still be inspired. Yes, of course, I agree with Etienne and Tatiana. Uh, discovery, as Etienne has explained, is a chaotic process. But on the other hand, if you have a brainwave and uh, it's going to be discovered and rediscovered, but we don't know exactly when it's going to have this huge impact in our world of knowledge. But if it's a brainwave, perhaps the second or third time or even the first time round, 
it's going to lead to a whole cascade of new brain waves. Thank you very much. We've had a number of questions that we've been put online. Let's listen to these questions. You showed us systems that are statistically stable. Are there such systems for which we know for sure that they're not statistically stable? It's an interesting question. All systems were thought to be stable. But finally, a system was found that is interesting because for one hour, the system is uh, located close to a point A, and then for 10 hours, it's uh, close to a point B, and then for 1,000 hours, it stays close to the point A again. So there, there is an association between A and B without any regularity. This example shows that uh, Lawrence dreams uh, is not always satisfied. So yes, there are systems that are statistically unstable, but they are very rare. Another question, is chaos only due to initial conditions that are not controlled? Or is this a deeper property of the system itself? Let me add something to this question. Are there systems that are not chaotic? You've made a distinction between determinism and chaos, but finally, nothing can be really determined uh, from the start. So can't we say that all systems are chaotic? No, 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 not at all. I'm going to give you a very simple example. If you take a pendulum marking a second, This is a very periodic movement. It's even used for clock works. The fact that the pendulum can be used for clocks is based precisely on the regularity of the fact that the initial position is uh, not vital for the future. If you change the position of the clock, it's not going to change the movement of the pendulum. So the movement of a pendulum is not chaotic. If you take the movement of the Earth around the Sun and uh, over reasonable lengths of time, less than 10,000 years, well, there is an ellipse and uh, every year you go back to the same point. So it's very periodic indeed. The chaotic effect I mentioned earlier on was to be observed uh, over lengths of time of millions of years, but on shorter lengths of time, the movement of the Earth around the Sun is not chaotic at all. It is very periodic indeed. So there is indeed a balance between chaotic things and regular non-chaotic things. I think there is another question online. Yes. It's both a question and a comment by Christian Merka. To start with, many thanks for your presentation. Between crystal and chaos, crystal is very an example of order and chaos an example of disorder. Isn't there life in between? Well, well done for this question. Excellent question. Yes, indeed. Life is very often characterized by a very regular structures like crystals. In the antiquity, people were even wondering whether a crystal was not a living being because it grows and uh, develops. So crystal 
is very often considered or was very often considered to be uh, full of life, whereas obviously it's not a living being. But why is it so and yet has this capacity to grow? This is a very big question. There are also quasi-crystals that can be chaotic. So in that case, you are really at the interface between chaotic systems and non-chaotic systems. There is another question to the three of you. You are well known on uh, social networks uh, for the clarity of your uh, presentations. There was a sentence that was quoted, liberation from the uh, uh, straitjacket of time is uh, something that mathematicians can do. So the question is about the great liberty of mathematicians and scientists in general. And on the other hand, art, science and art, mathematics and art, are you entirely free in what you're doing? Or do you have a straight jacket yourself? Well, this is also a very interesting question that um, could be answered over a very great length of time. In the 18th century, mathematicians uh, got rid of the third dimension and started working with the fourth or fifth or sixth dimension. Similarly, in the 19th century, mathematicians were able to get free of Euclid's axioms and uh, developed non-Euclidean geometries that have different theorems. Molia wrote to his father, I invented a new world. Well, indeed, there is a tremendous liberty and freedom in creating. The only constraint for mathematicians is that mathematicians have to create a world with theorems and structures that have to be consistent. If everything is consistent, indeed, there will be a new world. It's quite astonishing that mathematicians were the ones who got free of these straight jackets like Euclidean uh, geometry or third dimension. Globachevsky, Riemann, and quite a few others did so. There is a lineage of uh, great mathematicians. But for a long time, it remained a pure creation without any practical, tangible repercussion. In physics, for example, relativity theory was able to see the light of day only because Riemann's theory existed beforehand. And now you mentioned art. I'm not an artist, far from it, but I think that around the beginning of the 19th century, uh, 20th century, the fact that mathematicians got rid of the obligations or the constraints of geometry helped artists to get rid of the academic rules of perspective, for example. And suddenly, you could uh, see paintings by Picasso or Duchamp and other people who had a different way of looking at the world. I'm going to give you an interesting example. There is a software, the name escapes me now, but uh, it's very useful. You can write a name or a word in this software, and the software will look in all the Google, Google books that are in his, its memory, and uh, he will describe you the frequency of this word in time. So you'll see between 800 and 1800 and 2020, the number of times this word has been used in French, English, or German. And there is a wonderful example, the word geometry in the plural. The word software for a long time used to correct you if you wrote geometries because the author of the software, of the word software, thought that geometry was one and uh, there was no possibility of having several geometries. It has changed now. But if you look 
at the evolution of the usage of the word geometries, it was nil until the year 1900. And then there was an explosion. The word geometries appeared in literature. And I think it's a wonderful example of the fact that mathematicians created abstract new words, worlds for their own pleasure, for their own fun. And it turned out that these new worlds were helpful for physics, for art, and enabled artists to get free of uh, all the rules that you can see in the Renaissance paintings, for example. What do you think about it? Maybe Tatiana, do you want to start reacting? Yes, I agree. Thierry Courvoisier mentioned something important in his presentation at the beginning of our evening. The fact that mathematics were there to be used as tools for other branches of science. It's very important, and it's true. But there is another aspect. The visionary aspect of mathematics, which I find absolutely fascinating. It's there where magic works, when there is a consistent theory without any internal contradiction, you can use it in different areas later on, for example, in physics. And in uh, the history of science, this happened on several occasions. And all these developments are extremely interesting. On the other hand, the aesthetic aspect is very important. There is a huge aesthetic aspect of mathematics. The theory of music, for example, is based on mathematical laws. But you can also think of other forms of uh, implementation of mathematics in visual art. At the beginning, at the turn of the 20th century, a huge uh, number of possibilities were opened up. And you can now start having a visual interpretation of these uh, quasi-crystals, for example, the Penrose Pavage, uh, Penrose, who just uh, received a Nobel Prize uh, this year for physics. Or you can also think of um, the wonderful images of Escher. These images are extremely based on mathematics, and they make sense in mathematical terms. They also have a great value in artistic terms. So I think the mingling and the conjunction of all these aspects is in, uh, contributing to the beauty of mathematics. Etienne, do you want to say something? Yes, let me add something. You shouldn't think that visionary beings find out things that uh, are implemented later on in physics. That's not always the case. It happens sometimes, but it's not always the case. And if you take the example of non-Euclidean geometries, you have to put that in the historical context. Gauss was one of the first mathematicians who uh, invented that. He was a mathematician, but also and above all, a physicist. And his intuition for non-Euclidean geometry, who helped him freeing himself from uh, old traditions, was not due to his vision, but to, to very tangible and practical reasons. He was uh, recruited by a king and uh, um, entrusted uh, with the task of uh, drawing up the map of Hanover. He received money. He used uh, craftsmen. He had to uh, measure hills and distances. And he measured the whole kingdom of Hanover. And doing so, he wondered whether it was true, indeed, that 
the sum of the three angles of a triangle on the Earth is 180 degrees. And he realized that the Earth is not flat. And therefore, starting from the point that uh, this was not a Euclidean geometry, he was wondering what kind of geometry do you have on a round Earth? And this was the starting point for the creation of a new geometry where he freed himself from old axioms. What I'm aiming at is to tell you that there is a constant ping pong game between abstract thinkers and physicists, for example, mathematicians and physicists. And sometimes Gauss, for example, himself, are such genii that they can combine both. Anton, do you agree? Yes, indeed. Many things have already been said by my colleagues. I'll just add a few remarks. This criteria of beauty of aesthetics in mathematics is very important. But there is an also there is another criterion, usefulness, something that can be used in biology, physics, or other areas. It's quite surprising and astonishing that these two criteria are coinciding in many cases. An idea can be both beautiful and very useful. We don't always understand why that is so, but it is so. If you find something that is very beautiful, you may not know what it's going to be used for. Maybe you have to wait for hundreds of years before you know. But in the end, there will be an implementation and application of that beautiful idea. Now, a last question I'll put online. These uh, very beautiful mathematical theories were born by from the conjunction of different branches of mathematics. Is there a connection between chaos theory and uh, topology? Well, it's very easy for me to answer that question because the creator or the founder, one of the founders of topology was Poincaré, one of the uh, founders of uh, dynamics was uh, chaos dynamics was uh, Poincaré too. In his introduction to his book, he explained very clearly that his motivation or his interest for topology was precisely due to the need to understand better dynamics. One of the major contributions of Poincaré was to understand that topology can be useful or useful to um, dynamics. Let's take a very simple example. If you want to understand the movement of planets around the sun, and you, if you want to write down the equations of these movements, you need to understand first the space of configuration, as you call it, that is the all the areas, all the places where planets could possibly be. And Poincaré explained us that the topology of these spaces are revealing quite a few things about dynamics. These two topics are closely linked and very often they're nearly the same. Thank you very much. We're close to the end of this evening, but uh, let me add a last question which will be repeated over the whole of the week, and I'm going to ask it tomorrow and the day after. You described what an axiom is. It's something that doesn't need to be demonstrated. And you said that for some mathematicians, an axiom is true if it corresponds to what you can see in the real world. So that leads me to this question that I find fascinating, because I also had to be confronted with it in my mathematic courses at university in 2000 or 2001. You published a book uh, about the origins of mathematics. This question is wonderfully summed up on the cover of a magazine which is called Science et Vie, which you obviously know, dating back 90 to 1999. 
and this is the title the mystery of mass is this an invention of the spirit or is this a description of reality do we invent mathematics or do we construct them with our intelligence well it's an excellent question do you give me two or three hours to try and answer it two minutes only oh well as you can imagine it's a key question in the philosophy of knowledge I'm not going to answer it as a philosopher but as a mathematician because I'm not a philosopher at all mathematicians do not ask th themselves that kind of question when they work on a function on a probability on a, an abstract mathematical object they take these objects as something that exist not as constructs or abstract uh, ideas when they try to de demonstrate a theorem most mathematicians have a Platon platonician vision of mathematics they don't ask that themselves that kind of questions they create theorems they want to demonstrate things but your questions are interesting but you should turn them to philosophers a mathematician is a craftsman is someone who works uh, uh, day by day on very specific problems mathematicians who wonder about these questions are extremely far and few between obviously I know that Jean-Christophe Yocos used to say that he was uh, fully platonician uh, certain forms of diamorphism were existent for him and were not examples of uh, constructs of uh, electrons in my brain there were things that existed for him just like Plato used to say the circle is something that exists it's not an abstract idea it exists somewhere I'm not going to try and, and uh, enter into a philosophical debate but I'm talking about the day-to-day -day life of a mathematician even if you talk with a student in mathematics about real numbers well even the definition of a real number is something very abstract but not for mathematicians pi is something that exists so I'm stopping with my questions now at least for tonight my answer was given uh, from the point of view of the laborer, mm -hmm, the worker. Thank you very much to the three of you for this uh, absolutely fascinating discussion. The right colloquium will go on tomorrow, as you know, with Laure Saint-Raymond, who will also be online and talk about uh, the work of his, her life. I invite you to attend her conference as well. Thank you to quite a few people now, Thierry Courvoisier and the whole team of the Wright Foundation. Anton Alexeyev, thank you very much for supervising the whole week and uh, setting up the uh, scientific program of this colloquium. Thanks to the University of Geneva. Thanks to all those uh, who were in charge of uh, making this possible. Thanks to the interpreters. and. Uh, there is no light, sound and light show, but if you're interested in visualizing mathematics, uh, uh, there is an, an exhibition called Belmat, which is on the website of the Wright Colloquium and which you can look at uh, at your pace. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to tomorrow evening, and thanks very much, and have a very uh, nice evening in Lyon and in Paris. Thank you.